There are billions of dollars worth of condominiums and high-end homes being built in Ontario these days. In fact, at one time, there were more cranes in the skies here at Young and Eglinton than in the entire city of Boston. But what's not such a priority is the construction of affordable housing. And that's where the former chief planner for Ontario's capital city comes in. Jennifer Kiesmet has co-founded a new development company, Marquee Developments. And it's very much not focused on luxury condos, but rather on affordable housing. Let's find out more with Jennifer Kiesmet, who joins us now from Midtown. And former chief planner, it's good to have you on our airwaves again. How are you doing? It's great to be here. I just wish I was in the studio. Well, don't I too, believe me. Uh, we, we've had one guest here in 19 months, but I'm not complaining. We're happy to be able to talk to anybody this way as well. I want to start with a story, Jennifer, and that is a story that your partner, Jason Marks, who's done very well in the development business, incidentally, made a lot of money. It's a story that his daughter apparently is responsible for. She had a conversation with him one day, and I'm hoping you're going to pick up the story from where I've left off. Well, it's actually his son, uh, but after many years of success in building rental housing in the city, um, you know, he the question was put to him, you know, Dad, my friends can't afford to live in this city. Is there a way that you could use your powers for good to fix that? And that was the beginning in many ways of the journey of marquee developments on Jason's side. My side came from a bit of a different place, which was recognizing our object failure um, as a city to be building housing for middle income earners. But yes, that is very much where it started was a recognition that there's an entire generation that is struggling to access housing in the city that they love, where they were raised and where they want to continue to pursue their life. You would really say the city's record on this constitutes an abject failure? Oh, yeah, I would. Uh, what we're seeing right now, um, access to housing, an entire generation is being locked out. And I'm not just talking about home ownership, but also in terms of rental housing. So despite the fact that we've been adding a significant amount of supply, we have not been adding a significant amount of affordable supply that is targeted to those people who are the lifeblood of the city, nurses, teachers, all those essential workers that we claimed pots and pans for at the beginning of the pandemic are consigned to a long commute, being forced to live very far away from where they work because of access to housing. And this is something that we can fix, but we need to have a really concerted effort on it to do so. So what's the mission of this new business you've set up? Well, the mission of this new business is uh, it's really, really aspirational in some ways, but the goal is to transform access to housing, particularly for those middle income earners. And in some ways, this came from a recognition that what we've seen happen in cities uh, historically like Vancouver and San Francisco, uh, where you start to see this very strange twisting of the ecosystem of a city when you no longer have shops and restaurants because the people who work in those shops in restaurants can no longer afford to live in the city, that that actually gets at the very DNA um, and the lifeblood of a city. New immigrants are fundamental to the narrative of the city of Toronto. They're fundamental to our economy. But when new, new immigrants cannot come to this city and get a foothold because they are spending 60, 75%, 80% of their income on housing, that begins to threaten the overall lifeblood of the, of the city. So our goal at Marquee Developments is to build not a little bit, but a significant amount of affordable rental housing that is targeted to those middle income earners. And we've created a model to do just that. Let's let's do a couple of definitions here then. Affordable for you means how much and middle income earners means how much? <clears throat> yeah, this is an important question because in the old way of thinking about affordable housing, we thought of affordable <clears throat> housing as something that was delivered by governments and was subsidized over the long term. In the new model, we're talking about affordable housing as not having a long-term subsidy, but also not necessarily built and operated by governments, but there's an incentive in place for people in this space who want to deliver affordable housing to be able to deliver it in a market economy. So what does that mean about the 
income of a household that can access this housing. Well, really, anyone, any household earning between fifty and one hundred and twenty thousand dollars as a household currently cannot afford the average rent in this city. You know, home ownership is a completely different conversation. So we're just going to focus here on on rental. So our model is about bringing those things in alignment by providing housing that is geared to that middle income earner. So approximately 20% below the current market rent. And that varies from one part of the city to the next. It's different in different parts of the city, but the city of Toronto has a definition uh, that they use depending on um, what it is that you're building. How can you be sure that the people who will ultimately either purchase and or rent these properties are in fact the target audience you want to pick up as opposed to wealthier investors who may want to pick it up for other reasons? Well, that can be managed. That's really an operational question. And the City of Toronto currently has processes in place to do that. But there will be an income testing in order to access this housing. But also because we're talking about rental here, we're not actually talking about the condo market, which is the space that investors are very engaged in right now and are tying up a significant amount of our housing our housing stock. So we're building housing that is for an end user. So um, in the operation of the housing, it'll be pretty clear, for example, if units are not occupied. Gotcha. Okay, what did you learn in your time as chief planner for the City of Toronto that you are finding right now is very helpful to you being able to achieve this mission? Oh, so much. Um, I feel like all of the little strands of my uh, professional life are coming together in this moment and on this exercise. So we live in a big city that has a complex regulatory context. There's municipal policies, there's policies through the Toronto Regional Conservation uh, Conservation Authority that are a legacy of um, Hurricane Hazel. And then we also are enabled by a regime at the provincial level through the Ontario Planning Act. And it's actually pretty tricky to navigate. It's not surprising that, let's say, when a church decides to build some housing, that they get stuck in the process and they can't quite figure out how to distangle that process and move forward. So I have the benefit of being deeply embedded in that process and understanding the various nuances of that process. You know, I understand with quite a bit of in, quite a bit of intimacy how Section 37 works, how parkland dedication works, how top of bank regulations work. And when you're building housing, uh, because there are so many ways that housing can potentially impact on the public interest, there are a lot of different processes as well as policies that need to be navigated in order to drive forward an outcome. So I benefit from having been both a policy writer and a policy implementer um, in those conversations and actually figuring out what can be done on the site. Because City of Toronto is pretty unique. Uh, we have a negotiated process. Most, Almost everything that gets built in the city is an outcome of a negotiated process. So knowing how to move through that is critical to being able to deliver housing. Well, you've described it as pretty tricky. I've heard other people describe it as damn near impossible. So somewhere, I don't know, you want, you want, to, um, you want to take a, a second take at whether or not pretty tricky <laughs> or damn near impossible actually gets closer to being what the truth is here? Well, you know, uh, my challenge is that I see this from both sides because I see how things like an extensive public consultation process is put in place in order to protect the public interest because there's been instances where the public interest has not been at the fore in a development process. So, you know, I see those things that a typical developer might see as being onerous I see those things as actually delivering on a public good. I, I care passionately about creating a sustainable city. Many of the policies that we need to navigate in the approvals process are put in place in order to deliver a sustainable city. So um, does that add a layer of complexity? You bet, adds huge layers of complexity. Is it in the broader public interest? Well, yeah, it actually is. So, you know, a colleague of mine, uh, Larry Beasley, former um, chief planner of Vancouver, has often said, we need to recognize that it's a privilege to be able to build and develop in a city. And that is the reason why developers must participate in this broader public process and regulatory context. 
And I'm, I'm a firm believer of that. Now that I'm sitting on the other side of the table, it hasn't changed my belief that everything we do has to seek to negotiate and protect the broader public interest. But I believe that affordable housing is a critical part of that. Understood. Let's show a couple of pictures here of what you've been up to. This project is one that you're working on. It's called Tyndale. Now tell us what is sort of distinctive or significant in the marquee approach to what we're seeing here. So there's a few things that are distinct about uh, Tyndale Green, which is on Bayview Avenue. It's a very, very large site. And as a starting point, we ask the question, how can we ensure that we're protecting the ravine landscape? So 35 acres of the site are not going to be developed. Um, that's a really important starting point. So, you know, I mentioned those environmental policies. A traditional developer would probably push back on that. Um, this is also not a high density development. Despite the fact that you may see what looks like taller buildings, most of the site is four to eight stories. The, the vast majority of the site, because we wanted to create a pedestrian environment and really walkable community, but we also wanted to put a really strong emphasis on pedestrian life and walking in this neighborhood. So there are a variety of buildings and they're all arranged around a series of different public spaces because we our objective here is to create a community hub, a community gathering space. So we've also layered in a new recreation facility a cafe, a daycare has been integrated into this into this space. You know, if a traditional developer was doing this, you would see a lot more density. You would probably also see a bank or a shopper's drug mart. Um, but we've tried to keep it very, very community community focused in the in the approach, um, and the, that we're over providing with respect to the city's requirements on public space and park space. Uh, requirements. And that's because we see that as being a critical part of the quality of life. 50% of the homes in this community are geared towards those middle income earners. That's by design in our model. And when do you expect it'll be done? Well, if the planning process, that tr tricky complex process, mm -hmm. goes according to, uh, to the schedule that we're currently on, we'll have a shovel in the ground in 2022. And by 2025, we'll have our first occupants moving into their new homes. And when you, I presume you had to go to some kind of public meeting and present this idea to uh, whatever. Uh, well, you can tell me in the answer. What what was the reaction like when you presented this? So, um, you know, we had two really strong reactions. One is not surprising, which is a lot of people were very, very concerned about traffic. Um, and this is one of the tensions that you see in a city that is transitioning from having very suburban places and very urban places. And we're talking about not adding a lot of cars, but adding a lot of new new homes in a relatively suburban community, although there are tall buildings and some significant density uh, adjacent to this area. So a lot of concern about, about traffic. Um, but surprisingly, um, we had a lot of people who came out to the meeting who asked us why it wasn't denser, hmm. who asked us why we didn't have more tall buildings. And I have to say this caught me off guard at the meeting. Um, I wasn't expecting it. And they were very important and critical questions. And it's a reflection of how the conversation is changing in the city. And there is new groups, um, Housing Now, another group is called More Neighbors Toronto, that recognizes that a critical part of creating an inclusive city and a city that is for everyone means we need to add more housing and in particular housing for middle income earners. So those constituencies were very involved in the public meeting and we're asking for, uh, we're kind of holding us accountable in a, you know what you don't usually see in a meeting. They were saying, look, we need as much housing as possible don't underdevelop these lands. Um, and, you know, we were kind of on the hot seat to reply to why we felt from an urban design perspective and a city building perspective, why this is in fact a good approach to um, density and design on the site. Okay, let's bring up a shot of the next project that you're working on. This one's called Sumac. And uh, same question, what's noteworthy here about what we're looking at? So Sumat's really, it's really, really uh, a very fun project in part because it is right in the downtown. It's adjacent to the Corktown area as well as the distillery district. 
uh, the West Dawn lands, and it sits on what historically had been thought about as kind of a leftover piece of land. It's where the, you know, most people know it because it's where the cube building, those iconic kind of um, buildings that was plunked down on this site. It's where that building is today. So there's surface parking lots, there's some heritage homes that we've integrated into the development. And what's unique about it is it's a model of maximizing a public benefit which is the heritage integration. We're creating a new public space, but also a significant amount of rental housing in combination with building a condo component to the project. And part of the, one of the questions we asked at the beginning of this development was, is there a way that we can create a new community that prioritizes affordable housing and also placemaking and design excellence? So we put a really, really strong emphasis on design excellence and creating a strong pedestrian uh, pedestrian realm, places for gathering, linking into the open space network adjacent uh, to the north and also to underpass park to the east. Now, I gather, I'm going to ask you about a third development you're into as well. This one's in Little Jamaica. And I gather that the guy who wanted to develop the place originally had in mind luxury homes, and maybe you convinced them to go another way. Tell that story if you would. So, you know, as, you, as you're probably getting the sense, all of our projects are like really unique and have a very interesting creative element to them. And that's the same with our project in Little Jamaica. It's actually a little bit of a different story. The landowner, uh, he bought this land and wanted to develop housing for his community in Little Jamaica. And he went to the city and discovered that he could build luxury townhomes and, you know, essentially was concerned that he would be gentrifying his own neighborhood. And so through a process of uh, different connections, uh, we were introduced and we were challenged to figure out a way to deliver 100 percent affordable housing on this site. And we're now moving forward with 53 affordable homes that will be rental on this site in partnership with the landowner. So this is a really good example of when you get creative, there could have been nine luxury townhomes. That's what the current planning framework allows for. We went to the city and began collaborating with the city around how this might be a pilot for mitigating gentrification and instead ensuring that we're creating the right kind of housing in the right location uh, in the city. And our land partner, um, who is really very interested in this question of delivering affordable housing for his community, um, you know, is absolutely thrilled and we're moving forward. Um, and Councillor Josh, Josh Matlow is the councillor in that area. And he's very, very excited about this pros prospect of demonstrating that we can build 100% high quality affordable housing in Little Jamaica. So who do we blame for the fact that it sounds like the rules as they are in place almost encourage you not to build affordable housing? Well, we maybe blame history because what's not unique is the city of Toronto. You can look at any city across North America and this problem exists. And it goes back to an old framework for thinking about how land uses are regulated and divided in the city. You've heard the term, I'm sure, the yellow belt, which refers to an area of the city that is yellow in the city's official plan. And historically, those areas were designated for single family homes. Now, you can imagine this comes out of an idea of what a family is, what a good neighborhood is, uh, how we are going to live in our homes. And it's actually an old idea. When you look at our census data today, uh, a majority of Canadians actually live alone. And that's for two reasons. People are coupling later in life and we're living longer at the end of our lives where we're also more likely to be living alone once again. So the kind of housing we create and design and the communities that we create and design needs to respond to that. And we also know that, hello, we've got a you know environmental crisis. Uh, we haven't been using our land very well. So adding density as we're doing in the Little Jamaica project, and we're doing it in a very incremental way, uh, gentle density. We're talking about an incremental 
upscaling of the existing zoning to allow for, you could have in those nine three-story townhomes, you could have approximately three stories. We're now building up to five stories. And by changing the design and changing the layout, we're creating a really significant new affordable housing stock. In some ways, Steve, what's bizarre about this is it's really going back to the past. We have these types of walk-ups all over our neighborhoods in the city, but really in the 80s and the 90s, we outlawed them. We preferred single family homes. And by doing so, we really limited the housing options that exist in our cities. So the opportunity now looking forward is to think about new built forms, new and new regulations need to come with those new built forms. Okay, you ready for a smart aleck question? <laughs> Always. <laughs> now that you're a property developer, do you hope to make a killing? Well, if I hope to make a killing, I wouldn't have set up this company that I've set up um, because this company, our mandate as a company is to deliver affordable housing. That's our objective. We've been established in order to do that. Um, but, you know, one of the things that has happened since I've been doing this, and my partner, of course, was running a private company for many years, is that I've really learned how to read pro formas in a way that I wish I had understood when I was chief planner. Uh, and I did do some sessions with my planners on understanding the mathematics of a development project. But I understand that in a much more sophisticated way because, you know, I spend a lot of my time in a, head in a spreadsheet now, which I didn't do before. And I think that building the broader capacity in the public sector and also amongst the, the, the public to understand where value creation takes place can lead us to a place where we're focusing more on the public good and on delivering public outcomes, which has always been what I'm passionate about. That isn't something that's changed. I'm just doing it from the seat I sit in now versus the seat I sat in before. And how will you know whether this new venture is a success? Well, on my whiteboard over here, I think I have I originally had that we wanted to build 10,000 new homes over 10 years, uh, but we think we're going to do more than that based on the trajectory that we're on right now. Every time we hand over a key and someone moves into a home that can be their forever home, where they can be safe, where they're in a um, healthy community in sustainable buildings, where there's things that they can do within walking distance of home, Every new home we build and every time we provide a home for an individual or for a family, every time we do that, that will be a measure of our success. I am really narrowed my focus professionally, although I get to bring in things like transit-oriented development and heritage conservation. I'm very, very passionate about ensuring that everyone in this city and ultimately everyone in this country has a safe and stable home where they can live to their fullest potential and flourish. That's Jennifer Keysmat, the former chief planner for the City of Toronto, now a co-partner in Marquee Developments. Jennifer, it's always good to have you on our airwaves. Thanks again for sparing the time. My pleasure. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.